Hello, listeners. This is Kat, and welcome back to Put Your Hands Up Podfix. This will be the continuation of Prodigal. This will be Part 6, Chapter 6, entitled Phoenix. Shota was trying not to drift back into unconsciousness. Sensei, are you all right? His response was to tighten his hold around Izuku. He was worried that if he tried to speak, his voice would shatter into a million pieces. There were still so many unanswered questions. He had no idea where this kid had been, what had happened, why he had left. Anxiety and trepidation had not left. The true confusion of the situation only reaffirmed when he pulled back to look into the kid's eyes. One green, one gray. God, problem child, what happened? Izuka's mouth formed a thin line. Not here. You need help. I need help. Shota laughed maniacally, the shock finally setting in. The overwhelming relief and joy at seeing his kid had not dissipated, but it was beginning to mix with the extreme stress of not knowing anything. He was an underground hero. He usually had all the answers before anyone asked. Have you seen yourself? Kid, what happened to your eye? The sixteen-year-old clicked his tongue, gaze, looking back toward the exits. Again, not here, I... He paused, glancing back to his former teacher. He searched, showed his eyes for something. I promise I'll tell you. Everything, Shota pushed. Izuka hesitated before nodding. Everything. But first, we have to get you to Masa's apartment. He'll be worried sick. The teen gently pulled Shota to his feet and laid his right arm over the boy's shoulder. Together, they stumbled out of the room and down the hall. He let Midoriya lead the way since he seemed to have his bearings. They weaved around corners as quietly as possible, but their caution appeared unwarranted. No one came after them. They mentioned others. Shota hated relying on a student for help. He should be the one aiding him in limping out of a prison he had been held in and tortured, not the other way around. I got them out before I came searching for the leaders, Izuku explained. Stumbled upon you, which, um, hello. Shota let out a bark of laughter and surprise. Hello, problem child. Izuku ducked his head at the pure affection that soaked up Aizawa's voice. I didn't think I'd ever see you again. The hushed confession made his heart clench. I have a knack for finding lost things. Midori's shoulders tensed, and his eyes were misty when they met his, but he smiled. You do. Though, I suppose you found me this time, he admitted as they began climbing a flight of stairs. Some teacher I am. Don't, the kid snapped. You were the best. You... You were the best. Shota grinned wryly. Kiddo, I don't know if you've noticed, but you've been missing for four months. I tried finding you, but your mother had no idea where you were, and the rumors flying around school didn't help matters. I know it has something to do with Yagi, and— Shh! Izuka covered his teacher's mouth with his gloved hand. His relaxed posture was quickly forgotten. His broad shoulders tensed, and his eyes flickered from one wall to the next, each nook and cranny, scanned in trepidation. It's not safe. The underground hero decided to concede his current confusion. Instead, he let himself look at the kid. He was at least two inches taller— his curly hair had been buzzed underneath, but still maintained its insane curls. He had more freckles, which almost made his cheeks a darker shade than the rest of his tan skin. He could see several new scars on the exposed portions of his body. Aizawa was torn between, staring at the cloudy iris and adamantly not looking at it. Someone had hurt Izuku so badly that he was blind in one eye. Someone had carved new crevices into his skin, had left blemishes that no sixteen-year-old should bear, had placed more weight on his young shoulders. Someone had heard him, and Shota had been none the wiser. I'm not blind. Shota looked back. He held eye contact this time. Izuka mustered up a faint smile. It was a sad echo of the wide grin he wore before. I have special glasses I wear during the day and goggles designed for my vigilante activity. It's... it's not that bad. A new bundle of inquiries appeared in his brain. You're a vigilante? No. I just wear this tight outfit for fun, Midoriya snorted. Aizawa pinched his nose. Don't sass me, problem child. I'm not above giving you detention for disrespectful behavior towards your teacher. Something about that phrase made Izuku stiffen. Any humor that had been fostered between them dropped. Those bi-colored eyes fell to the ground. The grip on his wrist tightened. Shota found himself scrambling to keep up with the suddenly changing moods. Of course, sensei. Sorry. Kid, no, I was joking. Shota swallowed, praying that the teen would look back up at him. Unfortunately, the submissive and wary nature displayed by Izuka was not one of the new additions to his character. 
From day one, his flinching and stuttering had been red flags for abuse. Shoda had met Inko and had ruled out the sweet woman, but abuse did not just come from parents. Even though Izuku had grown while at Hiwe, he had always maintained that air of a child who had seen mistreatment. It seemed that whatever had happened to him in the past few months had not helped that trait at all. Izuku seemed adamant on not looking at him, so when he spoke again his eyes were trained staunchly ahead. There's the door they brought me through. We'll come out in a warehouse, I think. Our stuff should be in there. His voice was soft, and Shota wanted nothing more than to wrap him up until all his anxiety disappeared. He could only tighten his grip on the kid's fingers and hope he understood. Sounds good, problem child. Izuku's lips twitched. Shota counted it as a win. I like the haircut, he hummed, wincing at a particularly sharp pain in his leg. Finally, those eyes swooped back up to his. Really? The pro nodded. Makes you look older. It suits you. Masa said I went from 13 to 17 when I got it, Izuku chuckled. Which doesn't make any sense, since I'm still 16, but he just talks sometimes. They reached the landing, and Izuku pushed the door open. Shota kept his pride under control at the sight of the kid's strong arms thrusting through the entryway. He remembered the slight muscles he'd had in his first year. Detective Namasa, Shota asked quietly, struggling through the short corridor. Another door, and then they entered the warehouse the kid had mentioned, immediately. They both began glancing around for their stuff. Yeah, Midoriya answered. He's been taking care of me since... Something came over his eyes then, and Shota was scared he would start crying. He was not sure he could handle the crying Izuku without breaking down himself. He was still warring with all his own emotions and questions. If the kid collapsed, then his tentative self-control would shatter. I thought you said something about not here, his teacher muttered. The kid nodded taking a deep breath. They searched for roughly twenty minutes before Shota spotted his belt and capture scarf. Relief flooded him when he found his phone unbroken with half its battery left. He shot a quick and discreet text to Nezu to tell him he was still alive but would not be back for a while yet and could he please arrange for the care of his class. A few crates over, Izuka let out a whoop and dove into a pile of gadgets. Are those your goggles? Yep. And oh, he dove back into the heap of weapons. And my guns! Shota froze, head whipping to the right. You're what? The walk to Nalmasa's house was made one hundred times more difficult because of Shota's limp leg. What should have taken the pair twenty minutes had lasted an hour, and by the time they reached the back door, the underground hero was about ten minutes from passing out. The pain had only grown with each step until he was practically leaning all his weight onto Izuku. The kid never complained, just hefted a little more of his teacher into his arms and kept going. God, this kid... Izuku did a rhythmic knock on the door and it swung open. Naomasa stood there, eyes wide and rimmed with red. His frantic gaze swept over the disgruntled pair. Evening, Izuku hummed with a wan smile. Sorry I'm late. The detective surged forward and wrapped an arm around the kid's shoulders as best he could without upsetting Shota. He whispered something urgent in the teen's ear that Shota deliberately did not listen to out of respect and then pulled away. Yes, I got the info, Masa. Who do you think I am? Izuku smirked, cocking an eyebrow. They're quite loose-lipped when they think you're just some dumb, quirkless kid, which, granted, I am, but I'm also me, so... The detective suddenly let out a bark of wet laughter and reached up to ruffle the kid's rambunctious curls. And you saved a racer head. Eh, it was a joint effort. Shota drawled. Izuka grinned. Definite win. Now Masa quickly got them inside, and Izuka settled him onto the couch. Lift that leg, Sensei. You first, Shota hissed. The fierce protectiveness that arose whenever any of his kids were in danger had not disappeared when Izuku had. Now that the kid was back in his sights, it resurfaced with a fervor. Each cut on the kid's skin was like a neon sign of his failure. Namasa came around the corner with a professional first aid kit and dropped to his knees beside the sofa. After running a hand down Izuku's cheek, an action that the kid leaned into with warm familiarity, he turned to Aizawa. Sorry, Eraser. As much as I want to agree with you, Zuka's injuries are a little less severe. Those ribs and your concussion need to be taken care of. Shota opened his mouth to protest, but Izuka began to make himself comfortable on the floor to tend to his own injuries, so he remained quiet. How'd you get out? The detective threw the question over his shoulder. Apparently Midoriya finally deemed it safe enough to speak and answered. I was talking to Dobby when they got me, seven of them and one of me. I'm good, but not that good. He rolled his shoulders and slipped off his shirt. Bruises covered his toned abdomen. 
and dried blood lined his collarbone like a red ballpoint pen disaster. There was a new scar across his chest, but it was not light red like the others he had obtained due to his quirk. It was paler than the rest of his skin, much like the one on his face. However, Shota's memorization of all the problem child's new wounds was halted by the words he said catching up to his brain. Did you just say quirkless? And Dobby. Izuku's proud smirk wavered before disappearing. He glanced towards Namasa, brows pinched together, a silent conversation passed between them before the viridian-haired kid sighed deeply. It's a long story. Kid. The sixteen-year-old did not raise his head. Shota immediately amended. Izuku. Green eyes met his, and there was so much there. Pain and heartbreak and betrayal. A strength that Shota did not understand, formed by years of something. Something that he felt he was on the precipice of knowing. Midoriya had always been an enigma, a coiled mess of power and insecurity, of bravery and fear formed by years of abuse. Shota stared into those beautiful green eyes, and hoped that Izuku saw someone he could trust in his own. He did. Izuku leaned against the couch, his curls falling across Aizawa's left leg. It was a sign of tentative faith. Sensei, everything you know about me is a lie. Immediately, he wanted to refute that, but Eri always said he was a good listener. He let the kid continue. I was born quirkless. Izuku swallowed, and there was a shift in his eyes. He had seen it happen before. In a minuscule moment of weakness during his time at UA, Izuku would shudder inside himself, become a shell. His eyes would glaze over, like he was reliving a war behind his fluttering eyelids. He would shrink, hide. Noises made him jump. The world around him became a battlefield filled with mines and tear gas. Every conversation was dangerous. Every inflection and differing tone could be another bullet to his flimsy shield of excuses and dishonest courage. Shota had seen the act before. He had witnessed the switch in Midori's attitude twice before. Each time, however, the kid had shaken himself out of his stupor and kept going. It was an extreme act of strength and self-discipline. He was an idiot for not asking about it sooner. A and I'm not lying, he urged quickly, waving his hands. I got the test done three times, and each time it came back the same, and... And when I was diagnosed, my dad left for America and didn't come back. I lost all my friends, and my teacher stopped liking me. I... He swallowed, shoulders falling. I became worthless. Again, Shota wanted to review the statement, to scream and shake his shoulders. Already he was beginning to grasp reality. The first time I was told to kill myself, I was six. He whispered, playing with his fingers to keep from looking at him. Every day my teachers would look away when the bullies hurt me. When I came back with bruises and a bloody nose, they would tell me that it was my fault. And maybe it was. But that still didn't. He broke off sniffling. It had got worse. My mom started ignoring my scrapes and bruises. I learned to avoid coming in the front door when she was home, so she didn't give me one of her disappointed looks. I was always at a disadvantage, scrambling to keep up with the kids who actually mattered. Showed a bit his tongue so hard blood shot against his gums, he was burning with rage at the images Izuku's story concocted. Little Izuku, green hair and freckles, smiling brighter than a sunrise being hurt by his peers and the adults who were supposed to protect him. It was no wonder the kid had not trusted him when they had first met. It was a wonder the kid trusted him now. I wish I could say it got better, but... He shrugged. I'd be lying. Middle school was filled with suicide baiting and a sad grade average. My teachers blamed me for any misconduct, as I'm sure you saw in the transcript of UA. Shoda never looked at transcripts from the teachers. He would much rather make opinions for himself, unbiased and without others' influence. Another mistake. I got in trouble all the time. He waved, trying for nonchalant and hitting exhausted by mistake. I was the troubled one, the one that people always saw as a nuisance and a waste of space. The bully spread the rumors that my quirklessness was contagious, so no one would be friends with me. I was alone. More images, each more harrowing than the last, Izuku, sitting by himself at recess, Izuku with flowers on his desk, Izuku stumbling home, his mother's back to him as he made his way to his room. Izuku patching up his new wounds with slim and shaking fingers. Izuku, unwanted. That last one was impossible for him to imagine. Kachan was my best friend before I got diagnosed. He continued quietly, 
picking out a scab on his forearm. After, he became the main bully. He called me Deku, because it meant worthless. He was right. Now Masa's grip on the bandages tightened. Shoda did not move his eyes from the kid. He had already been overlooked enough. He did not deserve that from Shoda. At least, not any more from Shoda. He had never told me to kill myself, but the day he found out I was applying to UA seemed the perfect opportunity. And here, here a tear finally slipped down the kid's cheek. It was as if everything else he could manage, but the thought of Bakugo telling him to die was too much. He burned my shoulder. You can still see the scars. And indeed he could. A faint palm outline was settled on the ridge of his collarbone and shoulder. He wanted to be angry. He wanted to find Bakugo in his dorm and expel him, but Aizawa knew better. He knew that the explosive teen was trying, had gotten repentance. He had been there for the aftermath of their slowly mending relationship. He had seen the progress both of them had gone through. Bakugo would be a great hero. It was unjust for Shota to judge him on past mistakes he was trying to gain redemption for every single day. That day, the sludge monster incident happened. I'm sure you heard about it. All Might saved me. When, when I asked him if I could be a hero even without a quirk, he told me no. And Shota could not keep the growl between his teeth with the admission. It came out like the rumbling thunder of a mama bear's deadly bite. Izuka tensed, but did not move away. I almost jumped. Namasa gasped in tune with Shota. A horribly sad laugh came from the boy. I know. Another statistic in a long line of graphs and charts about the poor quirkless kids who've nothing left to live for. But I didn't. People needed saving, and while... Other people have always come first, I guess. I used to think that that would have made me a good hero. And it would. It would have made him a great hero. Izuka's selfless view of the world would have made him fantastic. Shota wanted to kill every person who had told him otherwise, starting with Yagi. After the sludge incident, All Might offered to train me, and... He glanced up at his teacher quickly before looking away again. He... He gave me his quirk. Shota narrowed his eyes. What? Now Masa tied off the bandage to his head. All Might's quirk is called One for All. It's transferable. The brief explanation left him with questions, but he decided they were for a later time. So, the quirk you possess now is that quirk? Izuka swallowed again. He reached up and wiped his wet eyes. I don't have it. What? Shota was fairly sure he had seen Izuka surrounded by green lightning and soaring through the sky like a falling star. Sleep deprivation did a lot to the brain, but he was certain he had not imagined that. I don't have a quirk anymore. He bit, but it was so small, like a dog who'd been kicked to the point where its bark was quieter than a bird. I... Mirio has it. Eyes on the froze. The world around him became black and white. Four months ago, Mirio had started spending an unexplainable amount of time with Yagi. He had sacrificed his apparently precious time with Eri to disappear into the gyms or off campus with a retired hero. The entire time, he had been training, but Shota had not known for what. He was training with Azuka's quirk. I got it the day of the entrance exam. That's why I didn't have any control over it. He rushed to explain immediately. The look on Aizawa's face must have been furious, and he believed it was aimed at him. I promise I'm telling the truth. I worked so hard just to get to 5% power in my hands, and even then I had to break myself over and over again. I... I wasn't a suitable vessel. That's why All Might asked me to give it up. You... You really don't have a quirk anymore. The question just made the kid wilt more. He shook his head. And my mom doesn't... She... Perhaps Shota should have known. Now Masa confirmed his horrible suspicion. Midori Inko kicked him out, less than a week after it had happened. She didn't want a worthless, useless, quirkless kid, Izuku whimpered, drawing his knees up to his chest. Not that I blame her. Izuku. I understand, which is kind of the saddest part, he laughed, running his scarred fingers through his already unruly hair. Mirio makes much more sense, and he won't have to kill himself to... You don't have to justify that bastard's actions, Izu. Now Masa's hands were fisted on the couch. We've been over this. But he's right. No, he's not. Shota could hear the venom dripping from his tongue, he could feel the need to have Yagi's neck under his hands so deeply his fingers naturally tightened. Any respect he had had for the pro was gone, dismissed like sparks on the wind. Shota was going to kill him, 
He was going to rip that cork from Yuriu's bloody hands and he was going to give it right back to who it belonged to. He was going to take Izuku all the way to the number one spot if it killed him, and he was going to be so damn proud. You. Shota stopped and swallowed. When had the tears appeared? You are the best, Izuku. You gave everything to be a hero. You are the best. The problem child hiccuped. He shook his head. You don't have to say that. I know that you think I'm more trouble than I'm worth. Shota regretted every time he had implied such nonsense, even when the kid was being difficult. No child should ever feel like they're a waste of space, that their teachers are tired of them in that way. I think you're wonderful. Izuka let out a dry sob. You don't think that. Why not? Shota suddenly had to make the kid understand. He had to drill past the years of insecurity to make this precious child know how much Shota adored him. Because you're a teacher, and teachers don't... Izuku, I believe you. The kid's breath stopped. His hands were shaking. Shota reached down and hooked his pinky through Izuku's. It was something he had seen the kid do with Eri whenever she was overwhelmed or scared. The action was not lost on the teenager. Izuku, problem child. I believe you. He wondered how many times someone had said that to him. How many times had someone truly looked at the beautiful, wonderful, good kid that Izuku was, and listened, believed, trusted him? Shota knew that there had been times he had not, but Izuku had always tried to earn that trust, that faith. He had always striven to gain a love he did not think he deserved. All the fearful looks, the desperate need to prove himself, made sense now. His reckless disregard for his safety. It all made horrible sense. If he had been taught his entire life that his existence was worthless, that he had no use, then if he believed someone else would be better off at the cost of his own life, he would gladly give it away. The shattered bones, the bloody body, the breaking and aching and hurting that he endured was all worth it in his eyes if other people were better. It was a dangerous mentality. It was a fatal mentality. And I am so fucking proud of you. Izuku sobbed, turning and throwing himself into Shota's arms. The underground hero grabbed him and held him tighter than he had in a dungeon, nestling his nose into the kid's curls. He pressed Midori's body so close to his own that he prayed it left an imprint so he never forgot how precious he was. Shota looked at him, this sixteen-year-old kid who wore his heart on his sleeve with pride, who sacrificed it all for those who did not deserve it, who burned himself to dust like a phoenix and clawed his way out of the ashes and kept going. Shota looked at him, and he could not speak. He could hardly breathe as he gazed at Izuku Midoriya, this combination of dying star and gentle waves, who smiled with crinkled eyes and bore his teeth like a roaring lion. And he believed, just for a moment, that perhaps the gods did grace the earth with their presence, for only the fingers of heaven could have shaped such a being. He vowed to do right this time. He would do better. I promise, problem child. Thank you, Izuku whispered. Shota found himself smiling. A tear slid down his chin. I'm not sure I deserve that. The kid laughed. Aizawa did not know why. It's not about what you deserve. The underground hero laughed dryly and sneaked a kiss into those green locks. There was work to be done. Adoption papers first, therapy second. He was getting this kid under his roof before the fortnight was out. That was a promise. Now, what is this thing you said about Dobby? All right, listeners, this concludes Chapter 6 of Prodigal. Chapter 7 will be next. I hope you all are still enjoying it. As always, thank you so much for listening.